Hello, everybody, and welcome to your Ruby Live event. My name is Eric Weinkoop, and I'm the Director of Culinary Instruction here at Ruby, and I'm also one of your chef instructors in the courses. And uh, specifically, I want to welcome you to my office hours today. Uh, this is your chance to ask questions regarding food and cooking, and it's my opportunity to do my best to provide a response. And, uh, you know, as we get started here, I want to cover a couple of items. And uh, the first one is that uh, you can see on the right hand side of your page the questions that have already been uh, sent in and uh, they have been uh, put into the queue. And if you would like to participate by asking a question or even sharing a comment, uh, you're welcome to do that by typing in uh, your question in the dialog box in the upper right hand corner of your screen. And that'll make its way to the queue. And then the second item is, uh, if you look at the individual questions on the right-hand side uh, in the gray boxes, um, in the upper right-hand corner, again, of the individual gray box, you'll see a heart-shaped icon. And if you would like me to answer that particular question sooner than later, you can click on that icon and it'll bump it up in priority. Okay, but, um, you know, otherwise, we'll get to the questions today. All right. And uh, so, you know, without further ado, let me go ahead and jump into uh, today's list of questions. And the first one uh, is from Lenora. And it says, could you explain the difference between white onions, yellow onions, sweet onions, and red onions? And does it really matter in a recipe to substitute one for the other? Uh, so I will uh, answer this uh, rather simply um, by saying that basically, as we look at different onion varieties, you know, aside from, let's say, the color difference that the onion might impart to the dish that you're preparing, uh, there will be a difference in sweetness level and moisture level and, uh, you know, also a, um, a, a heat or that, that harshness, you know, that comes along with onions sort of a level. And um, now uh, the, the onion flavor can also vary in intensity. And uh, I think, you know, really when it comes down to, to cooking, cooking your own food, uh, the biggest considerations are going to be the, uh, the tradition right behind the recipe or that dish that you're preparing, and then also your personal preference. Um, and it, it actually might run along the lines of convenience as well in terms of just what onion do you have in your inventory. Um, and, and, I mean, otherwise, is there a difference? Sure, right? Again, based upon, uh, you know, what I just started out uh, talking about. But um, what you end up choosing is really going to be up to you. OK, and, you know, give it a try. You know, you might uh, buy a few different onions and try them in a given preparation or try them throughout the week so that you have um, uh, the ability to compare those results. And uh, you can start to figure out uh, which ones you might prefer. Um, and, and maybe it, it turns out you like them all, which makes it a very simple decision. All right. Thank you. All right. And the next question. Uh, I personally believe the faux meat options being produced and marketed in stores and restaurants are highly processed and just as bad for the gut as the SAD, the standard American diet. What is your opinion on these alternatives for the whole food plant-based lifestyle? Aha. Uh -huh. So thank you very much for, for ask, asking this question. It's an interesting one. And I, I think also a relevant question uh, in, in this this era, right, of so many uh, uh, products uh, that um, sort of fill that plant-based um, space. And um, yeah, let me first uh, start by uh, sharing a little bit of history. And that is that, um, uh, and actually uh, addressing a couple of terms as well. And, and let me start with the terms actually, and they are uh, vegan versus 
whole food plant-based. Okay, both are plant-based. But um, the first term that came onto the scene uh, some decades ago was, was vegan. And the term vegan right, uh, refers to plant-based foods, um, but it was uh, used primarily by folks that had uh, first and foremost, the goal of protecting animals and, uh, um, you know, the idea of human health was secondary. And to some extent, right, I think those folks are still around today, but they have been eclipsed by uh, the mainstream uh, consumer that is adopting um, more plant-based foods uh, or maybe even going 100% plant-based for their health primarily. Okay, there. I'll take a little tangent here and say that there are arguably many reasons, uh, you know, to to go plant-based, uh, including the environment. Uh, there's of course animal lives, animal health, uh, and human health as well, uh, individual as as well as the collective public health. Um, but as we take a look at, um, you know, this, the vegan approach from years ago, uh, the focus was very simply on plant-based foods, uh, which meant that uh, processed foods, uh, those convenience foods that they were replacing, uh, were also very important uh, to, you know, to the daily lives, the, the convenience, right, of the consumers. And uh, that has remained, right, such that today when we go to the store and we look at the, those center aisles that carry all that processed food, all the processed foods that we have been critical of for a very long time, even before the, the plant-based movement, right? They're now um, occupied by plant-based options in bags, boxes, and bottles, for example. And, um, uh, you know, are they as bad as their animal counterparts? In some cases, they probably are. In, in some cases, they're probably less harmful, but still not particularly good for you, okay? Um, especially in comparison to the other term, right? Or this, this other um, approach to plant-based eating that we, I think, should consider. And that is the whole food plant-based approach. And, you know, uh, eating a whole food diet, um, this is an interesting topic, right? Uh, you know, on, on one hand, if we think about uh, whole food, it is just that. It is foods in their whole form, uh, whether it's a, a grain or a legume or a fruit or a vegetable or, or something else. Um, the challenge is that it's not always convenient to eat whole foods. Uh, and then also uh, we have the, the issue of how do we qualify or, or define or you know, um, sort of draw a, a line around what is and what isn't uh, a whole foods. So in other words, if you take a, a grain, say wheat, and you cook that wheat berry, we still recognize that as the whole food. And, um, you know, we can probably agree that um, uh, it constitutes the, the whole food in, in the plant-based realm. But as we start to process that, grind it uh, into a flour, um, I don't know, is that still the whole food? It, it uh, probably still contains all the constituents of the wheat, but it certainly looks different. And the way the body uh, interacts with that now um, more uh, simple to access food from a uh, you know a digestion standpoint. Is it the same? Uh, and some people would uh, say no, it's not, and others would ignore it. Uh, instead, favoring the uh, the convenience that comes out of having the option of using wheat in a ground form. Uh, because then we can use it to do different things, such as make bread um, or thicken a liquid, okay? And all of those things are, uh, are good, um, but uh, it, it changes uh, the food, that, that basic food, at least uh, a little bit, okay? Um, 
so you know these become uh, I think personal uh, philosophical questions that need to be addressed and you know when it comes to eating food uh, it is a, an intimate act one that we uh, engage with uh, in most cases multiple times each day and so just like other uh, very personal and intimate activities that we engage in, we we might consider food, um, you know, in, in that in that category and start to think about food, um, and 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 the way that we interact with it. What does it mean to us, um, and what sort of um, ancillary issues to food are important to us? You know, such as uh, the environment, right? The soil quality, uh, uh, erosion issues water quality, uh, and other environmental factors. Uh, there's food processing and storage and all the packaging uh, that goes into food marketing um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, what I'm getting to is that while we might have a philosophy uh, that guides our life uh, in the realm of religion or uh, sex or something else that's very personal to us, we might also think of food in a similar manner, okay? Uh, and then uh, think about what you believe in and uh, what you want to put into your body, and then also how much time and energy you want to devote to that process uh, because uh, food preparation takes time uh, and cooking takes time. And uh, eating uh, ideally would be done in a slow environment where we take our time and enjoy the, the relationships and uh, our relationship with the food that we're, we're consuming, that we're enjoying. OK, and uh, so, um, you know, how you identify, uh, I think, is part of that. And if one identifies as vegan and, you know, we uh also look at the larger context of what the term vegan or veganism has meant and maybe does mean today, um, uh, and especially in terms of uh, all the processed foods on the market uh, that qualify as vegan foods versus uh, a whole food plant-based uh, diet um, and uh, you know, being a, a whole food consumer versus a vegan consumer. That's a starting point. That's a that's a philosophical question. It's one that ha has a lot of baggage attached to it, and um, it's one that a lot of people don't want to talk about because it's difficult. Um, it, it, our the, the convenience in our lives um, often trumps better decisions for us and for our families and for our environment. And um, uh, but I think if we take the time again to sort of disentangle. Uh, these various issues and start to understand who we are at a more foundational level and how we want to proceed uh, in this very complex world of food, uh, you know, it will help us, um, you know, deal with these issues around faux meat, for example, okay, and so many other things, um, you know, whether it's plant-based milks um, that really aren't based upon what they sound like they're based upon, um, and uh, the, the list goes on and on. So, um, Dion, I think, you know, you're asking the, the right question and you're asking a really big question and you're asking a very personal question. And, uh, you know, I encourage you and everyone else listening today uh, to think about what uh, food means to you. Uh, food has a history. Food has a culture. Uh, food is related to um, other life forms. Uh, as well as our own health and uh, and well-being. And uh, I think we should spend more time thinking about it um, rather than, for example, just the convenience or just the price tag of something that we choose uh, to consume. All right. Hope that's, uh, hope that serves as food for thought. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Next up uh, from Anne-Marie. Uh, can a garlic press be used rather than chopping garlic cloves? Um, so this is a, a fun question. And, you know, I would say, uh, Anne-Marie, that for, uh, certainly for the assignments, um, and, and maybe even for the duration of your time throughout the course, um, I, would I would encourage you uh, to use a knife. 
and to uh, get to know how to use the knife, uh, very importantly. And then also come to understand how the garlic interacts with the knife. Okay, because the results will be a little bit different than when using a garlic press. So at least very often that's the case. It probably depends more specifically on the type of press that you're using or maybe your knife skills. Um, but uh, I do encourage you to, to use the knife, to develop the skills and the confidence that comes along with that, uh, and then to focus on what the garlic is doing. Uh, in that um, very, uh, you know, uh, small dice, that fine brunoise state or that minced state. Uh, and then, you know, uh, branch off and, and uh, use your press. And uh, in those same applications, pay attention to how it's similar or different uh, than the, the diced or minced version. Okay. Um, and, uh, but, but otherwise, it's up to you, right? In that, that longer term uh, sort of cooking um, uh, question, right? The context is going to be totally up to you and, and what's going to be uh, best for your situation. Thank you. And we have another question related to, uh, to the allium, uh, uh, family here. Uh, so onions, uh, when I use a wood cutting board to chop onions, the smell and flavor of the onions stays in the board and transfers to everything else I cut on the board, no matter how many times I wash it. How do I uh, avoid this? Well, you know, I think um, uh, a, a couple of choices at, at least come to mind here. And one would be to consider a separate cutting board uh, for those stinky items, those uh uh, those alliums that you're chopping. And, uh, you know, another uh, thing to consider might be uh, a, a plastic or, a, you know, some sort of a poly um, plastic sort of a, a cutting board, which uh, cleans maybe a little bit more easily than a natural fiber board. But uh, on the other hand, if you want to stick with a natural fiber board, then probably having another board specifically dedicated to these stinky items might be the way to go. Thanks. All right, next up from Monica. What's the best way to keep fresh herbs in the fridge? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if there's a best way. Uh, in fact, I'm going to take a little tangent here and, and, and uh, sort of give a uh, maybe a, a preface by saying that um, when I'm posed with questions of what is the best dot, 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 um, I will usually say, I don't know. Um, because the best way will usually depend upon the individual user. And, um, uh, but I will talk about some ways that are uh, viable, they're good, um, you know, they're tried and tested, um, but you get to otherwise sort of figure out what might be most convenient for you as well, okay? And uh, so regarding the storage of herbs, um, you know, a couple of methods come to mind. And, you know, one is to store herbs upright in a little bit of water so that uh, they can continue to, to drink, right, or to be hydrated while they're stored. And uh, that is a method that some folks use, uh, both at home as well as in restaurants, and it can be successful. And another way to approach the fresh herb storage question is to wrap the bunch of fresh herbs in a wet cloth. And that cloth can be paper or it could be um, uh, linen, uh, up to you. But uh, it's another way to keep them uh, hydrated and also to um slow down evaporation okay one thing that happens in the refrigerator is evaporation the, the refrigerator fundamentally draws moisture out of the box out of that environment um, which you know in turn pulls moisture out of produce and so this is why after just a, a day or so um herbs can look very wilty uh, bell peppers can be wrinkly for example OK, and so it's an ongoing process and it's one where we have to balance uh, the dehydration that's taking place with, in some cases, rehydration. And this is where, you know, um, putting um, a wet cloth or towel around the herbs or standing them up in water helps. 
Uh, and then the third component here uh, in terms of the balance is to use the product as quickly as we can, okay? And uh, so we wanna try to use fresh product while it's fresh. Um, and at some point we can start to think about um, uh, about this longer term picture as one of trying to preserve old food or aging food. Okay, so there's a balance that needs to be um, that needs to be found, and you know part of that balance also is is buying the appropriate quantity at the correct time, meaning when you uh, can use it or intend to use it. All right, so. Um, all of these things are part of the storage and, and shelf life question, right? When, uh, you know, when this comes up. So I, I hope you'll consider all of those facets and see what balance works for you. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, how do you know if the pan is hot enough if you only have a nonstick Teflon pan, uh, is there another way to do the water test? Okay, so this is a question that I get um, from time to time from our students. And, uh, you know, the first thing I'm going to say is that when uh, heating the pan for sauteing, uh, our video lessons show stainless steel pans. Okay, and so all of the, that detailed discussion will pertain specifically to stainless steel pans. And so if you're using something else, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's Teflon coated or a, a copper pan or something else, uh, your experience will be a little bit different, okay? And this is where some trial and error, um, well, let's call it testing, uh, on your part will be necessary, okay, to figure out what will work best, not only with the pan that you have, but also with the uh, cooking technology that you're using, whether it's a gas range or an, an electric range or something else, and then also the individual power of the burners, right, uh, the BTUs um, that, that they're putting out will make a difference. And so, you know, each um, uh, burner uh, usually on your stovetop is different and your stovetop may be different from my stovetop. And so there could be a lot of variation we're talking about here. So you need to do some testing for your specific situation, okay? And um, so, uh, you know, the, the other thing that I'll mention here is that if you're using a pan that's coated, whether it's Teflon or some other type of coating, um, the, the general guideline here is, is to be careful um, not to, uh, uh, to heat the pan too high because heat will damage that surface. And the, uh, the immediate concern uh, can be off-gassing, depending on what sort of technology you're using. And then the other concern is that um, it'll start to, to, uh, to damage, you know, high heat will start to damage any coating. Uh, over a period of time. And it may not happen immediately, may not happen, you know, very soon at all in terms of, um, you know, trying to recognize it. Um, but get, given some time, um, it, it, it will wear out. Um, that heating and cooling cycle is uh, is a tough one on, on the cookware uh, when it has a, a coating. So um, what you need to do is start to, uh, to heat the pan up and don't worry about the, the mercury ball because that doesn't apply, okay? Instead, start to feel the heat um, with the palms of your hands, maybe with your arms, right, as you're cooking. And then also put your face over the pan and feel the heat in these sensitive areas. And uh, get some food in the pan and see how the food acts and reacts in that environment, okay? Uh, your goal is to impart color and to uh, develop flavor through the caramelization process. And uh, if you're working, for example, at a lower temperature point because you're working with a coated pan, then we need to consider a couple of things. One might be to put less food in the pan, okay, so that that smaller amount of food can um, start to absorb uh, the relatively greater heat from the pan itself, uh, and then 
uh, you know, also um, give it a longer cooking time uh, to uh, impart the color, to, to change the surface of the food, okay? And again, this is going to be testing on your part, um, but uh, stay away from smoke points and uh, if you're using coated pans and uh, pay really close attention visually uh, as to uh, what the food is doing. Also, listen to your food. It will talk to you. And then the big one is going to be to feel the heat intensity to, to get an idea of just how hot that pan is. The, the whole idea of this, um, you know, the so-called mercury ball test uh, or otherwise um, gauging the heat of the pan in this manner um, uh, is uh, to, to, to start to cook in this more sort of engaged and organic fashion. In other words, don't worry about using a thermometer uh, to gauge how hot the pan is. That's not the point here. It's to get you more smoothly and, and uh, you know, more easily cooking. Um, but it does take that extra um, effort of engagement and the testing that goes along with it. Thank you. All right, uh, next up from Peggy. Uh, I want to buy new cookware. Um, I'm interested in all clad copper core pots and pans. What do you think are the best brands? Now, is ceramic cookware good to use uh, for which dishes? Also, what are the pros and cons of non-stick pots and pans? Thank you. All right. Well, this is going to be a long answer, so let me get a sip of water here. All right. So let me first um, kind of pick off a couple of the the loaf uh, hanging fruit here, uh, you know, you're, you mentioned all clad um, copper core pots and pans. I think those are great. Um, I don't think you can go wrong with those. Um, regarding non-stick uh, cookware, okay, my uh, position on non-stick cookware is that uh, they are disposable cookware, meaning that over time, nonstick cookware, at least um, the stuff that I've used, there might be some, uh, some new technology out there that, um, uh, that I'm, I'm unfamiliar with, but uh, by and large, nonstick uh, cookware will accumulate scratches over time. And they may not be evident, um, I call them micro scratches, um, but with accumulation, that non-stick surface uh, becomes a little grippy and uh, food starts to stick. And at some point, you may want to replace that pan. And that's why I think of them as disposable items. Uh, and so my approach to the cookingware uh, collection is to get whatever cookware you, know, you want as your, your mainstream cookware, and then supplement that with maybe one or two non-stick items um, that'll get you through some specialty cooking um, where that would be most beneficial, okay? Uh, you ask about ceramic. Uh, is that good to use? Sure. You know, I've, I, I don't own ceramic pans, but I've used ceramic pans, and they work. Uh, they work fine. Um, I can't comment on them from a long, uh, you know, a, a sort of longitudinal test perspective. I don't know how they hold up um, over many years. Um, but uh, you know, other sorts of cookware like uh, stainless steel and uh, you know, cast iron, uh, these things will last literally a lifetime or more. Uh, they're very hardy. Um, now, in terms of best brands, uh, this is, again, a, a question that I'll kind of skirt. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I'm going to mention a couple of things. One would be when it comes to drilling down to a brand of cookware that you might uh, select, take a look at um, uh, product ratings online and try to find sources that you trust, whether it's Consumer Reports or some other hopefully objective uh, source that um, you know maybe isn't benefiting from these companies with free samples, for example. It's 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 hard to tell, but um, my point is uh, you get to do the homework and you get to find sources that you consider reliable, and. 
Uh, read about the cookware the, itself so you understand the specifications and, um, and, and what that means, okay? Um, I mean, copper core, you know, sandwiched layers, multi this and that uh, sounds pretty neat, but what does all that mean, okay? Um, and so do your homework. So you understand that. I'll give you, you know, uh, just a, a, a quick, you know, insight. Um, most pans uh, today, uh, we're talking about stainless steel that has some sort of um, something bonded to it or maybe a, a core uh, that's inserted. Uh, most cookware uh, has that today. Um, it's considered pretty standard technology. And the, the point is um, that stainless steel isn't the best conductor of heat um, but other materials like aluminum uh, or copper um, are, are better uh, at conducting heat evenly and um, in some cases faster. So uh, these are bonded to stainless steel in some fashion in order to create a more even uh, cooking surface, um, but with the durability of, of stainless steel. And um, there are many companies, many brands to choose from uh, and they range, you know, in price. And, and this is where the decision becomes a personal and individual one. And this is where, um, you know, I, um, I, I don't give advice uh, to, to anybody. I'll give information and then encourage you to do, you know, that uh, the, the homework, so to speak, to make the choice that's best for you. Um, but you can find uh, cookware sets um, that um, are... I'd say pretty accessible, you know, at places like Costco. Um, and then you can kind of go out from there in terms of climbing the uh, the price uh, tier. But um, again, take a look at the reviews and read what the consumers are saying and uh, read critically to see if uh, consumers are talking about the same issues that are important to you. Um, I like to start with the one-star reviews. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, if um, everyone's given five-star reviews and the thing is good, then there's nothing to worry about, right? But instead, I like to start the one-star reviews to hear about what the issues are, what the possible um, uh, you know, friction points are uh, that might be important to me as a cook. And uh, a lot of times... Uh, those one-star reviews don't mean anything to me because uh, the person that wrote that review was was fussing over something that was irrelevant, at least in my cooking world. And so, read those reviews critically, and uh, you know, make that decision that's going to be best for your particular situation. Okay, and um, yeah, have some fun, take some time, uh, and if you can, you know, also, um, even get your hands on some cookware that your friends might have, or, you know, family members might be using in order to get a feel for a certain brand of cookware before you buy it, that's a good idea too. Okay. Um, I guess the last thing that comes to mind is really one of uh, construction quality. And, you know, one thing that I like to do is, um, if I if I have a, a pot with lo a long handle, I'm going to try to see how easy that handle bends and look at that um, that connection point. Okay, um, there are some cookware reviewers out there that will say that you you got to get pans that, are, that have handles that are fastened with rivets and stay away from spot welds. Well, I disagree with that. Um, there is uh, cookware out there that um, is quite durable, uh, you know, with with both construction methods. And I've also come across pretty flimsy stuff um, with both, um, you know, handle attachment methods. And so you got to just take a look at it and see um, how robust uh, this cookware feels in your hands. And uh, again, try to try to bend it and um, and go from there. You know, you got, you got, you'll have it full of food, sometimes a few pounds of food. Um, and uh, you want this stuff to last for years, ideally, at least in, in uh, you know, from my perspective. So, um, you know, give it a test and uh, do some reading and uh, go forth. Thank you. Next question. What's your favorite Brussels sprout recipe? 
Uh, you know, very simply, uh, you know, I think about cooking methods rather than recipes, and this is really the Ruby approach. You know, we will uh, teach you the the foundational uh, uh, sort of cooking methods and ancillary techniques of cooking, so that uh, you aren't recipe dependent. And uh, so, to answer your question, Annette, um, I like to uh, roast Brussels sprouts. Let's put them in an oven, high temperature, you know, at least 400 degrees, and um, sometimes even higher. Uh, and then once you pull them out with some nice coloration on them, you can you can flavor them in any direction you want. And so this is where spices come into the, in, into play, uh, as well as fresh herbs. Uh, you might enjoy some other um, you know things like whether it's a, a, a vinegar, it could be a flavorful oil, it, it could be some other condiment that you might use. Um, but this is where you get to take it into so many different directions, and you can have a different experience each day of the week right? Or month or a year for that matter. All right. Give it a try. Thank you. All right. And Annette uh, is asking another question. Uh, how can you tell if mushrooms are still edible? Uh, you know, most mushrooms, as they start to um, uh, break down on you, are going to develop spots uh, of discoloration. Spots uh, are, are going to be different from what the mushroom started out looking like. So a, a white mushroom will start to develop gray spots, for example. And um, their texture will start to break down for the most part. Um, and you, they'll get wet, soft spots. And uh, that usually goes hand in hand with the discoloration. And so you, it's pretty easy to see, I think, at that point. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, otherwise, I mean, mushrooms can be pretty hearty, uh, hearty items. They can uh, take a lick in and, and still, uh, you know, be good after several days or uh, even a matter of weeks. And, um, you know, certainly if you um, have an abundance of uh, mushrooms, if you're a forager, for example, then consider drying them to extend the shelf life. And then uh, you can rehydrate them or you can grind them into a, a powder of, of uh, a, a coarseness that you desire. And you'll have that intensity of flavor to add to soups and stews and sauces and, and other applications. Thank you. Hi, Lily. Uh, I'm looking for a good quality of olive oil and apple cider vinegar. Any suggestions or brands to look for? Okay. So, yeah, this is another... Um, Kind of a, a fun topic here and one that we could probably talk about all afternoon, I suppose. But, um, you know, the the first thing that, that I always say to consumers and probably the first thing I do, too, is to take a look at consumer reviews online. Now, we just have access to so much wonderful information. And once again, try to find sources that uh, you might consider relatively objective. OK, uh, and then otherwise reliable in terms of the quality of information. Uh, that they would provide, all right, which means uh, probably avoiding a lot of the food blogs that are out there uh, that simply regurgitate information from the next food blog and really lack the, the depth and quality um, that, uh, that I prefer anyway. But um, uh, back to your question, um, you know, when it comes to uh, you know, uh, vinegar, again, that's probably an easier question uh, to answer by looking at uh, some brands uh, online, you know, some reviews, or even trying to do uh, just a, a comparative testing at home uh, by picking up two or three or four different branded products and seeing what you might like uh, the best. You know, regarding uh, olive oil, this is probably a more interesting question. You know, in that, uh, you know, think about the, the best olive oil, um, you know, as extra virgin olive oil. And, and usually it is, you know, for, for uh, a lot of applications. It's not always necessary, um, but uh, let's just talk about extra virgin olive oil for a minute here. Uh, and, and that is to say that um, there's been a lot of controversy over the years uh, regarding the adulteration of extra virgin olive oil. And there are a lot of folks out there um, that would argue that uh, the relatively low price um, uh, on extra virgin olive oil um, these days uh, is a good, uh, could, could be an indicator, I should say, that it, it may not be the real thing, that maybe we should, we should um, approach uh, the product with caution because um, it takes a little more effort to uh, produce um, a good product 
that would qualify for the extra virgin status. Uh, and then within the, 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 the greater pool of uh, olive oil that's produced, you know, there's going to be a smaller percentage of that that qualifies for extra virgin olive oil. So it would make sense that um, supplies would be limited and therefore prices would be relatively higher. And, um, you know, there's also been uh, stories over uh, a number of years um, talking about uh, the, the widespread adulteration of extra virgin olive oil uh, because there is so much money to be made, uh, you know, in this uh, in this area of the food world. Um, more recently, um, there's been a, a discussion, um, you know, an online discussion of sorts or a discourse um, involving uh, folks at uh, UC Davis that have done some testing, as well as uh, folks at um, the uh, California um, Olive Oil Commission uh, talking about the quality of product. And um, uh, you might take a look at, uh, do a search online to see if you can find some of that discussion and what the, what the um, more recent concerns are. But, um, um, you know, the bottom line is uh, uh, when it comes to uh, any foods that are processed, okay, anything that's, that's, uh, uh, maybe I should just say any food that you don't grow and produce yourself, you just never know about the quality. Um, I don't know if I would trust things 100% uh, because it's so easy to put a product out there that um, is misrepresented, in other words. Okay. And I hope that as consumers, that at a very fundamental level, we understand that. Okay that when we put our trust in a brand, there's still a gap between what the company is producing and, and what we're enjoying. That, you know, unless we're privy to the entire process and we understand what goes into handling that food products, um, we may not know what we just bought, okay? And uh, so please understand that if, if, if you're not producing your own food, that that's the reality in which we live, okay? But beyond that, um, we need to try to find some uh, sources that we can trust that will vet product for us. Uh, and then we can go forth and enjoy those things, okay? And you know, when it comes to buying something, um, you know, again, it's like buying a house or buying a car, buying a pair of shoes or something else. Um, what you think is important in your olive oil may be different than what I think is important in my olive oil. So uh, this is where it becomes an individualized and personal decision based upon your criteria, your cooking scenario. OK, and uh, so please, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, do, do your due diligence and do some product testing side by side in terms of the subjective components, uh, that enjoyability of that food item, and then, um, you know, make the best choice going forward for you. All right. Thank you. All right. Next up from Denise. Uh, how can I prevent the fruit flies when I'm trying to ripen my bananas? Um, I, you know, I would suggest a net. Um, you know, I've seen these very fine mesh fruit nets and um, they seem to be effective. Um, uh, I, I don't use one personally, but I, I have seen them in action and they appear to be effective. I, I think it's worth a try anyway, um, you know, short of maybe putting things in the refrigerator in order to, uh, you know, protect it from the buggies. Um, but give it a try and, um, you know, see what might work best for you. Thank you. All right, next question. Uh, trying to be more whole food, plant-based, and I like to try to avoid fats such as vegan butter and oil. I don't like avocado. Any recipes or what do you use instead for something to slather on baked potatoes or veggies to take its place? Aha. Uh -huh. um, you know, my go-to is spices. And uh, the spices open up a beautiful, aromatic and flavorful world. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a great way to dress 
um, you know, anything from uh, potatoes to popcorn. Uh, and you can start out by, uh, you know, using blends. And, and I suggest making your own blend, okay? And, uh, you know, in our courses, we typically offer a, a blend or two, sometimes more as a starting point. Um, and then start uh, getting to know individual spices and, you know, which ones you like, which ones maybe you don't like so much, uh, you know, which ones are very pungent, which ones are a little more mellow, and then start to do some combining on your own. And then you will find that you can blend your own spices and um, uh, dress up your baked potatoes and, and other things uh, in a way that uh, will take it into a, a, a direction uh, with a flavor profile that matches the other items on your menu, for example, or maybe the mood that you're in. Uh, but for me, spices uh, are number one. And then uh, a close second would be fresh herbs. And uh, here too, I recommend buying a selection of fresh herbs and then putting them out in front of you and, and tasting them. And then uh, you know, getting to know them on an individual basis and then getting to know what your likes and dislikes are. And then uh, you know, understand how they go with different foods. You know, spices will change with certain foods and, and herbs will change with certain foods. So even though you don't like it on its own, you might like it when it's paired with food. I mean, after all, we're not gonna sit down a, a, to a bowl of cumin seeds, right? Uh, we're going to toast them. We're going to grind them. We're going to pair them with other things like a baked potato. And you might find that you like it, you know, in that context of cooking. Okay. Uh, but go forth and discover the world of spices and fresh herbs. Thank you. All right. And next up from Sarah. I have no sense of smell. Some recipes seem to have uh, a requirement to saute till fragrant, uh, or it is best to choose vegetables based on smell. Can we get other ways to select fruits and vegetables? Um, sure. Um, you know, this is going to, uh, take some, uh, some practice, right. On your part, uh, in terms of determining degrees of ripeness. Okay. The, you know, the uh, aroma of, in this case, um, you know, fruits and vegetables, uh, would be, uh, linked to their degree of ripeness. And so the, you know, the more something, uh, is, uh, it ripens, uh, the, the more aroma they tend to, to put off. And, um, so ripeness is also accompanied with color change, uh, as well as, as texture change. And so, uh, you can start to look very closely and engage with your food at this deeper level in order to come to understand uh, what else is going on with that food that might point to uh, your ultimate goal, right? Which is going to be a, a, a good flavored item um, besides checking smell. Okay. And this is going to require some practice on your part. And um, uh, if you're, sm if you have no sense of smell, then I, I would expect that your sense of uh, taste uh, is also um, uh, affected in some way or another. So this testing process uh, may uh, require um, or benefit from um, somebody else that helps you as well so that you can look at these visual and, and tactile cues um, while this other person can give you feedback on the aroma and the flavor right, of the food. All right, because a, a big part of the flavor of food is the aromatic experience, right? And something like 75% or 80% of flavor perception is based on aroma. And uh, so in order for you to sort of put all these pieces together, it can be helpful uh, to work with somebody that um, is your, your smelling counterpart, so to speak. Okay, to help uh, help put those those couple of pieces together. All right, give that a try and uh, see how that goes. Thank you. All right, uh, next up, uh, any recommendations for balsamic best balsamic vinegar quality? Okay, so um, 
you know, the, the, the best, right, I guess uh, some people would say, um, balsamic vinegars are going to be the ones that are coming from Modena in, in Italy and in that part of the country. There are a couple of different designations um, for that uh, highest rated balsamic vinegar. And it's, uh, you know, it's based on age uh, as well as um, uh, organoleptic qualities, those taste and aroma qualities. Um, but, uh, you know, those those balsamic vinegars also command a very high price. And those balsamic vinegars, while delicious, uh, you know, in their own right, and while they enhance certain foods in certain contexts very well, they're not an all-purpose balsamic vinegar, okay? Um, you know, if, if uh, you want something that's got more acidity and, and maybe even a lower price point, something that's more accessible on a daily basis, then, uh, you know, you would uh, look at what some people would, would consider lower quality um, uh, balsamic vinegars. Uh, and uh, so when it comes to balsamic vinegars, there are these, there's a traditional method, right, of, of aging uh, the vinegar in barrels or casks um, over some period of time. Uh, and it, it varies depending on the quality that you're producing. And then there's a very different uh, category of balsamic vinegar, which is really, um, uh, it's not made by the traditional method at all. It's this shortcut method um, where um, uh, colors might be added to the, the base vinegar. Uh, there may be some aging uh, for varying periods of time. Not, not like uh, it would compare to the traditional methods, but um, there could be some months uh, of aging that go into these other um, products in this category. And these go by a separate ranking system um, of, uh, of grape leaves. And I think it's one through four grape leaves and four being a, an arguably better quality product, having um, uh, seen some, some aging, uh, also um, maybe uh, having been made uh, with grape must, you know, and other um, uh, pr uh, components that actually go into the, the traditional method of making uh, balsamic vinegar. Uh, but these are, are going to be available at a much uh, lower price point. Um, now, I will also add that in my experience in testing some of these branded products in this uh, less expensive uh, um, category of balsamic vinegar is that simply looking at the leaf rating um, is not uh, so reliable. Uh, in other words, the uh, the style of vinegar can be quite different in terms of its sweetness or acidity or sort of its richness on the palate. Um, so again, you would need to do some testing. For example, uh, pick up two or three or four bottles of a four leaf um, balsamic vinegar and then try them out and see how you like them. Maybe you choose one that you prefer for all of your cooking, or maybe there's a couple of them that you use for different types of preparations, different applications, okay? And uh, so give this a try and see what you come up with, okay? All of this comes down to uh, some personal testing based upon your preferences and your situation, all right? Thank you. All right, another question here. What does mince mean and what is the cutting technique? A recipe for a vinaigrette Ask me to mince garlic and herbs. Okay, so um, very often recipes will use um, two sort of umbrella terms. One is dice, and a dice refers to a nice looking, right, visually a, a, a consistent cut. Um, that is uh, hopefully a dice in its shape, meaning a cube. Um, and then there is the mince, which is an irregular cut. Okay, which in which case you would just take your knife across the product in different directions 
and cut it down to a small size, all right? Um, but there's going to be some inherent irregularity that could be part of the mince. Um, for both a dice and a mince, they can come in different sizes. Um, but generally speaking, a mince is pretty small. Um, but uh, there uh, is a fine mince and a coarse mince. And um, there's no uh, sort of uh, set criteria on how big those are. They're really relative to one another, okay, where a fine mince is smaller than a coarse mince. And so how big those cuts, those minces, uh, end up being, uh, you know, is going to be really up to you, okay, and, and uh, the style of cooking that you're going to produce. Now, you might also uh, take a look at some uh, other cooks and the way they mince food in order to get an idea of what that could look like, okay? But, um, I mean, otherwise, mincing in my book is pretty small. Um, but, uh, again, it, there's not a set size like there is with dicing. OK, um, but uh, again, mincing is relative to one another also from fine to coarse. Thank you. All right. Uh, next question from Elisa. What are some essentials you'd recommend for the entirety of the FOK course? OK, so uh, when you mention essentials, um, a lot of things come to mind. In other words, I'm not sure what, what you're focusing on, but um, let me answer this uh, in a few different ways. Um, when it comes to essential uh, skills, uh, as you move through the course and beyond, right, in cooking, knife skills uh, are going to be very important. And knife skills, um, you know, on, on one hand, we teach these uh, specific sizes and, you know, dimensions. Um, and we teach that in an attempt to um, encourage you to practice developing knife skills, okay? Um, beyond the course, it becomes less important for you to uh, stick to a one quarter inch dice to create a small dice, you know, for example, or three quarters inch cube to create a large dice. Um, but instead, uh, you know, understand that um, relative to one another, you've got bigger cuts and smaller cuts, and a dice is pretty much a cube. Although as you start to add speed to your cuts, the accuracy diminishes, okay? So there's a trade-off there. But the idea is uh, for you to develop confidence uh, with your knife skills. Uh, then the others would be cooking methods, you know, whether it's steaming or sauteing or, you know, grilling or roasting or something else, uh, to understand what that means and to be able to hit some uh, basic benchmarks, okay, um, that identify that particular cooking method. Okay, I think that's important. Those are essentials to take away from the course, all right? And then there are other ancillary techniques that support your cooking, whether it's um, um, mixing with a whisk or folding with a spatula um, or other activities. Um, you know, there are, you know, more or less efficient ways to do that. And so we, we, we learn when to use certain tools when to use certain techniques and then how to do them. And so, you know, those, um, those foundational building blocks, I think are the essentials to take away, um, along with product identification. Uh, so as we cook, right, there's a certain language that we speak just as with any other field that you might study. Uh, and so in, in the world of food, um, we need to understand ingredients you know, whether it's produce or, um, you know, olive oil or other things in packages, pasta shapes or, or whatever it happens to be, um, you know, come to know that vocabulary and that language of the kitchen so that as you're reading a recipe, you understand it, so that as you're having a conversation about that recipe with your friends or family, uh, that you all understand the same thing, that you're talking the same language. 
um, and, uh, um, and keep expanding, right, that world. Uh, the beauty of food is that it's never ending. Um, there's always something else to learn, some other place in the world to visit and to learn about and to enjoy. And I would consider those the essentials um, at, at this point, um, you know, in your, in your cooking tenure. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, and the last question from Toki, do you need to detox before going plant-based? Is it necessary to keep doing this for a plant-based lifestyle? Uh, you know, the, I'm going to uh, sort of uh, push you in the direction of um, uh, on this detox question, you know, towards somebody that you trust, um, you know, in the uh, health and wellness space. There are, um, you know, different approaches to detox and some different uh, philosophies and um, different beliefs uh, in what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Uh, and so depending on, you know, which sort of path uh, you're a student of, I would direct you toward a mentor uh, or somebody in that space to, to have that discussion, okay? And then how it fits into what you've been doing and how it fits into what you want to do. And, uh, you know, detox is, is a transition of some sort, right? Sometimes it marks a seasonal transition or some, some other type of a transition. Um, but um, detoxing means, again, a lot of different things. And the effects on the body can be subtle or they can be very harsh. And sometimes you can do it on your own. Sometimes it should be done under the supervision of somebody. And um, so that uh, really falls outside of the domain of uh, the Ruby Live event today. But I think a very important one that you might ask uh, your health and wellness mentor. Thank you very much. All right. And uh, that brings us to the end of today's open office hours and your live event. And I wish you uh, happy cooking and look forward to meeting you again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.